Welcome everyone for the first talk of the 2022 Winter CSC Robotics Colloquium. Uh, I am honored to have our speaker today, uh, Hang Yang. Doctor, uh, he holds a undergraduate degree from Tsinghua University and has an SM degree from MIT, both of which are in mechanical engineering. Uh, he is currently finishing up his degree at the Laboratory of Information and Decision Systems and uh, at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Uh, he is a uh, recipient of the Best Paper Award in uh, Robot Vision at ICRA and was a Best Paper Award finalist at RSS in 2021. Today, uh, he will be presenting to us his talk titled Surf Certifiable Outliers, Robust Geometric Perception, Robots That See Through the Clutter with Confidence, um, thank you, Dr. Yang, for um, uh, being with us today, and uh, we are all excited to hear your uh, talk today. Uh, if you want to take it over, you're more than welcome to start. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the, for the nice introduction, and uh, Happy New Year, uh, everybody. So I'm very glad to be here uh, to talk about certifiable outlier robust geometric perception. And the goal of the, my talk today is that by the end of my talk, hopefully you will be convinced that this line of research is promising for enabling our robots to see through the clutter with confidence. So as a robotics researcher, I'm very excited to see that robotics has been growing very fast over the last few decades. So we now have robots that can drive themselves, robots that can fly into the sky, robots that can, that can probe into deep space and also other planets, as well as robots that can potentially save human lives. So as we start deploying robots and autonomous systems, in some of these high, you know, safety critical and also high integrity applications, one of the most important questions becomes, are robots safe? And can we trust our robots to do what they are designed to do? So since autonomous driving is perhaps the robotic application that is mostly related to our daily life, I wanna use self-driving as an example to illustrate how safe our robots are at this time. So I want to broadly categorize uh, safety into two aspects. On the left-hand side, I have hardware safety, and on the right-hand side, I have, I have software safety. So when talking about hardware safety, a key factor is called crash worthiness, as defined as the ability of a structure to protect its occupants during an impact. So after many decades of research in mechanical engineering and also materials engineering, especially these crash tests, we now have cars on the road that have pretty good hardware safety. So even if drivers can sometimes make mistakes and get into accidents, hardware safety can help save their lives. On the other hand, when talking about software safety, a key factor is called trustworthiness as defined as the, as the ability of an algorithm to be relied upon. So here, the sad news is actually, although we are doing pretty good in terms of hardware safety, we're actually doing pretty bad in terms of software safety. And here, I want to show you a recent article that has a name, uh, Americans Still Don't Trust Self-Driving Cars. And this article has a few statistics to support its claim. For example, it says that nearly three in four Americans say that autonomous vehicles are not ready for its prime time. And about half of them say that they will never get into a taxi or ride-sharing vehicle that was self-driving. And even worse, about 20% of them say that autonomous vehicles will just never be safe. So in addition to these statistics, I think uh, most of us uh, here today have seen videos like this one showing autonomous vehicles making a mistake that a human driver will probably ne never make. So after seeing this, uh, you know, this, these statistics and also this video, I think a common question in our mind now is that, is it even possible to design algorithms for robotics that are guaranteed to be safe and trustworthy? So I, I believe uh, the answer is yes, because otherwise probably I won't be here today uh, to talk about my, my research. And in particular, in today's talk, I wanna focus on robot perception. And I wanna tell you my research in, in designing uh, robot perception algorithms that are safe and trustworthy. So I will, I will first tell you what is uh, robot geometric perception. I wanna highlight the issue of outliers and the theoretical intractability caused by outliers in a robot perception. And then to mitigate this theoretical intractability, I wanna present you a paradigm shift towards designing what we call certifiable algorithms. So I'll give you the definition of a certifiable algorithm and tell you why this notion of a certifiable algorithm can mitigate theoretical intractability. And then the main contents of today will be devoted into the toolbox for designing certifiable algorithms for robot perception. In particular, I wanna introduce you two algorithms in this toolbox 
The first one is an estimator and the second one is a certifier. And then after this, I want to briefly comment on perspectives and opportunities that arise from certifiable perception. So with this, the plan of today's talk, I want to first tell you what is geometric perception. So geometric perception, loosely speaking, uh, is the task of estimating geometric models from visual measurements and also priors. For example, taking a self-driving car uh, as an example again, it has to perform a wide range of geometric perception tasks. For example, it has to do object detection, post estimation, localization, mapping, and 3D reconstruction. And specifically in today's talk, I wanna use object detection and 3D reconstruction as two major running examples. Uh, in particular, in today's talk, the object detection is a task of detecting and also estimating the three degrees of freedom pose of, of a given object in, the, in either 2D images or uh, 3D point clouds. And then 3D reconstruction is a task of merging a pair of LiDAR or RGBD scans taken at different time and space to reconstruct the 3D environment. So now I wanna use object detection as the illustrating example to tell you what are outliers and why outliers bring us theoretical intractability. So in our object detection example, suppose our robot has taken a 2D image of a 3D vehicle uh, you know, driving on the road. And then suppose also our robot has an exact 3D model of this vehicle in its memory. And then the goal of this robot now is to detect this vehicle in this 2D image and also to estimate its, its pose with respect to its own coordinate system. So notice that the pose of a 3D object is nothing but the the 3D orientation and also 3D position of that uh, object with, with respect to certain uh, coordinate system. And then in this case, a typical perception pipeline uh, works as follows. So the robot first uses a neural network to detect 2D semantic key points in this 2D image and also establish matches from this 2D image to the 3D uh, uh, cat model in this memory. So for example, here I'm showing the catchings of the, you know, the semantic key points like the wheels, the mirrors at the doors and other and other and other points. And this step is typically called feature matching and it's known as the front end of this perception pipeline. So in practice, due to various sources of uncertainties and imperfections, so the front end can sometimes make mistakes and generate a set of wrong matches. And these wrong matches are what we call outliers in geometric in geometric perception. So now the goal of the robot is to estimate the, the pose of this 3D vehicle using the set of correspondences or matches that are corrupted by outliers. And the robot typically performs this estimation you know, task by solving a mathematical optimization problem. So uh, in this mathematic solving, this mathematical optimization problem is typically known as geometric estimation and it's known as the back end of the perception pipeline. So with this you know, uh, decoupling of the perception pipeline into a front end and also a back end, I, I now wanna show you a key negative result. So what this negative result says is that outlier robust estimation is MP hard and also inapproximable. So basically what this, tell, this theorem tells us is that when there are outliers in the given set of matches, then it is impossible to design a polynomial time algorithm that can solve this geometric estimation problem to guaranteed optimality. So due to this theoretical intractability, the community has been focusing on designing algorithms that rather run very fast and run in real time for robotic applications. So for example, one of the most famous uh, you know, algorithms is called RANSAC, which stands for Random Sampling Consensus. So as this name suggests, RANSAC works by randomly sampling a subset of this given set of matches until some consensus is reached uh, in, in its sampling results. And also some satisfactory solution is found. So the result of RANSAC is that in most cases, it's actually pretty good. So it's gonna give you a result that is correct, like this one that's already shown, but in difficult cases, for example, in cases when there are many outliers in the given set of matches, then RANSAC will fail and give you a wrong estimate like this one shown here. So perhaps in safety critical applications, failing is actually not the worst. What is even worse is that, uh, you know, uh, Algorithms like RANSAC, you know, which we call heuristics, can actually fail without giving you any notice. So basically what I mean by failing without giving, it, giving any notice is, is that RANSAC and similar heuristics are not designed to be aware of their own success and their own failures. 
and they are not designed to be able to differentiate between the correct estimate that is shown uh, here and also the wrong estimate that, that is shown here. So hopefully from this you know, the theoretical result, now you can see that in, we are in sort of a conflicting situation because on one hand, the theory tells us that it is impossible to design a polynomial time algorithm that can solve this geometric estimation problem in the presence of outliers. But then for safety critical and high integrity applications, if you want to deploy these perception algorithms in our in those applications, then it's, then we still demand you know rigorous performance guarantees from our perception algorithms. So how can we mitigate this conflict between this theoretical you know intractability and the practical you know rigorous performance guarantees? So the rest of my talk will seek to resolve this issue by proposing a geometric estimation backend that is both tractable and also trustworthy. But before I go into the details of, of the rest of my talk, I want to sort of you know, define the boundary of today's talk and also set the correct expectation for the audience. So basically what I want to say here is that you know, today's talk only focuses on the geometric estimation backend, which means that we will not touch you know, the front end, which is feature learning. So basically this means that we are taken, you know, we are, we are taking these uh, correspondences as given and we do not modify them. And we also do not verify if these correspondences are actually correct you know, from a deep learning point of view. So although in the, in the end of my talk, I will you know, comment on brief, you know, comment briefly about op opportunities that can integrate or, you know, or couple the backend and the front end. But for now, you know, it's important to restrict ourselves uh, to only the geometric estimation backend. So with this clarification, I want to tell you that the, you know, the key step towards designing the, you know, a backend that is both tractable and also trustworthy is to shift towards designing what we call certifiable algorithms. So let me first tell you what, you know, what is a certifiable algorithm. So a certifiable algorithm, first of all, it's, it needs to be tractable, so, which means that it has to run in polynomial time. And then the goal of a certified algorithm is to solve an optimization problem P that depends on some input data D. And then when applying this algorithm A to solve this optimization problem P with some input data D, we require that A has to either succeed in solving P and provide the certificate of optimality or fails to do so. But in this case, it has to declare failure and provide us with the bound of suboptimality. And moreover, when applying this algorithm A to solve this optimization problem P, we require that A has to be able to solve P to global optimality for common instances of this input data D. So notice that the last requirement makes sense because in practice, you know, we don't want our, our algorithm to always declare failure. So let's put the definition of a certified algorithm in the context of, uh, of, rob of robot geometric, uh, geometric estimation. And suppose here is the set of all outlier robust perception problems. Then from the previous slide, the theorem tells us that it is impossible to design a single algorithm that can solve this entire set of uh, outlier robust perception problems. So the goal, then the idea of a certified algorithm is to solve a majority of this set of perception problems to global optimality in point normal time, and then provide you with certificate of optimality. But then for worst case instances, certified algorithms are actually allowed to fail. But when they fail, they have to declare such failure and then provide us with the bound of suboptimality. So you know, imagine a self-driving car you know, driving in heavy rain or heavy snow. It actually makes sense for the perception system to declare such failure and perhaps that the human driver take the wheel back. So that's the definition of a certified algorithm. And with this definition, I'm now ready to tell you a toolbox for designing certified algorithms in, you know, for, robot, uh, for robot perception. And in particular, this uh, toolbox will contain two algorithms. So the first algorithm is an estimator. So what this, what this estimator will do is to estimate the unknown geometric models uh, you know, from this visual measurements. And let's use uh, our original object detection example. So in this case, what the estimator will do is to estimate the, you know, the, the poles of this 3D vehicle using the set of outlier corrupted matches. And our estimator is designed to be a heuristic just like RANSA, which means that for common instances of this input data, our estimator will succeed and give you a correct estimate. But then for challenging cases, when, for example, when there are many outliers, then the estimator will also fail and give you a wrong estimate. 
So although our estimator is also designed to be a heuristic, it actually offers many advantages compared to ransom. So for example, our estimator is deterministic. Our estimator can be faster. Our estimator can tolerate a higher amount of outliers in the original set of matches. And our estimator can be used for problems where ransack cannot be applied. So since this estimator is also designed to be a heuristic, you know, which means that when this estimator fails, it's also gonna fail without giving you any notice. So then here comes the role of the second algorithm in this toolbox, which is a certifier. And then the, the goal of the certifier is actually to safeguard this estimator. In particular, when this estimator has succeeded, then our certifier will return a certificate of, well, of optimality. But then when the estimator has failed, then our, and then our certifier will, able, will be able to detect such failures and give you, you know, a, a bound of suboptimality for this failed example. And in even better, you know, in, in certain cases, our, our certifier is actually able to escape such, failed, such failures and also return you better you know, six, uh, optimal solutions. So from this high level overview of this certifiable perception toolbox, we can see that this, this estimator is designed to be robust and fast, which means that the, this estimator can often tolerate over 90% random outliers, and it can often run in milliseconds. While the certifier, on the other hand, is designed to safeguard this entire pipeline and provide you with rigorous performance guarantees. And you can think of this, think of this uh, certifier as a layer of additional trustworthiness to this toolbox. And uh, you know, last but definitely not the least, I want to remark that both algorithms are actually general purpose and, be, and can be applied to more than a few perception uh, applications. So in the, in the rest of my talk, I want to you know, dive a little bit deeper into the technical details of both of these algorithms. But before I go into the technical meat, I want to, uh, you know, I want to uh, first introduce you the problem formulation of outlier robust geometric perception. So recall that I, I told you in the very beginning that uh, geometric estimation seeks to solve a mathematical optimization problem to estimate the, the geometric models. So what exactly is the optimization problem that we are trying to solve? And uh, in the next slide, I'm gonna tell you one of the possible formulations uh, of, the, of, of formulating outlier robust geometric estimation. And this is our favorite one uh, so far. And I wanna present you this truncated least squares uh, estimation framework by using a simple example from 3D rigid registration. So what is this uh, problem of 3D rigid registration? So here in this slide, we're given two CAT models of the same uh, 3D vehicle. So one in blue and one in red. So the goal here is nothing but to find the best rotation and translation that can align this blue model to this red model. So suppose in this case, I have trained a neural network that can detect semantic key points in both of these models and also to establish correspondences between the key points. So suppose for simplicity, we're just gonna assume that the neural network uh, just gives us four correspondences, you know, points A1 up to A4 in the blue model and points B1 up to B4 uh, in the red model. So let's, let's first assume that all these four correspondences are actually correct. So if, the, if all these correspondences are correct, then we can have this generative assumption that each point bi is nothing but the rigid transformation of this ai plus some small noise. And then using this generative assumption, we can design a residual function that quantifies or measures how well this geometric model explains my visual measurements. So for example, in, in our case, uh, this residual function is nothing but the Euclidean distance between bi and the rigid transformation of ai. So intuitively, this residual function should be approximately zero if my unknown geometric model explains very well my, my visual measurements. And now using this residual function, we can seek the best rotation and translation by solving a least squares optimization problem that penalizes the sum of the squared residuals. So notice here in the formulation, I have you know, incorporated this normalization const constant beta i square that can account for possible different uh, sensor models. So if everything is as perfect as, as what I've described here, then this problem is actually pretty easy. So by easy, I mean that you can actually solve this problem in close form. But I've already told you that, you know, also the theme of today's talk is that 
The difficulty of geometric estimation lies in the existence of outliers. So what will happen if we have an outlier in this set of correspondences? So let me now falsify the third correspondence by moving this point B3 from the wheel of the, of the red car to the roof of the red car, and therefore creating an outlier shown here. So in this case, if you still solve this least squares optimization problem, you will find that you know, the solution you get will be far away from the desired 3D transformation that you're looking for. So therefore, what we first need to, to, to do here is to design a better optimization problem that can help us find a better you know, 3D rigid, trans rigid transformation. So how can we do this? So we can first you know, modify our gener generative assumption by, ex by explicitly differentiating between an inlier and an outlier. So for an, for an inlier, our previous assumption still holds, but for an outlier, we will allow this point BI to be arbitrary 3D points. So now with this updated generative, generative assumption, you can see that we cannot expect the residual function to be approximately zero for both the inlier and the, and, and the outlier. Therefore, what we do is we pick a threshold that separates inliers and, and outliers. And we will use this threshold to truncate our least squares optimization problem. And this creates the truncated least squares optimization problem. So after this truncation, you will realize that we are actually still penalizing our you know, inliers using the least squares model. But then for outliers, we're going to discard them from this optimization by setting their you know, objective, objective value or loss function uh, to be constant. So here, this will be the mathematical equation that can realize this truncated d squares formulation. So let me clean up a little bit and get rid of this toy example and show you the clean version of the TLS estimation framework. So in this, again, in this formulation, uh, the inner minimization here realizes the truncated d squares cost function. So the TLS estimation framework is actually known to be robust against a large amount of outliers, but there's no free lunch. So the difficulty here is now that the TLS estimation problem is non-smooth, non-convex, and therefore also MP hard to solve in general. So in order to reliably solve this TLS estimation framework, we've designed an estimator that is based on graduated non-convexity. So the idea of graduated non-convexity or GMC in short is actually pretty simple. So the idea here is that although we don't know how to reliably solve this TLS estimation framework, but we do know how to reliably solve the least squares optimization problem. Therefore, the idea of GNC is that we can start solving this problem by solving a least squares optimization problem. And then we can gradually add non-convexity to the cost function until it reaches the final uh, TLS problem that we are trying to solve. So let me illustrate how GNC uh, works uh, in a simple example. So in this simple example, this, uh, this surface plot here shows the uh, kind of the loss function of the uh, TLS estimation framework. So as you can see here, there are many local minima in the, in the surface plot, which means that if you use a naive optimization strategy, you're gonna easily get stuck in one of those, uh, one of those local minima and won't be able to find the desired uh, global minima in, in the center. So the idea of a GNC is that I'm gonna you know, not solve this uh, original cost function directly, I will solve the least squares optimization uh, you know, first, which is this smoothest version that is shown in light blue. And then I will solve a sequence of problems with more and more non-convexity until it reaches or converges to the final TLS estimation problem. And then by solving this sequence of problems, the trajectory of the optimal solutions shown in this uh, blue curve, uh, so in this, in this white curve, is gonna converge to the desired global optimal solution. So it turns out, this simple idea can be actually applied to much more complicated robot perception problems. So for example, here, I'm showing uh, the running history of GNC on post-graph optimization uh, in simultaneous localization uh, and, and mapping. So in this example, you can see that despite there are many outlier uh, sensor measurements in the original, uh, in the original data set, uh, GNC is actually able to reconstruct the correct robot trajectory and also reconstruct the correct 3D map after a few iterations. So due to the kind of the, the simplicity and also the robust performance of GNC in, pra in practical applications, now it's actually part of the official MATLAB navigation toolbox. And it's also implemented in uh, other SLAM packages such as GTSET. 
So in practice, we found that GNC is typically robust against about 70 to 80% random outliers. You know, this is already a very good performance. But in, in certain perception, uh, perception applications, the estimator really needs to be able to tolerate over 90% random outliers. So how can we go from this robustness against 70% random outliers to a robustness that is over 90% you know, uh, outliers? So our strategy here is to design a general method called Robin that can prune or remove outliers before running uh, you know, graduate non convexity so let me go. Let me go back to the our toy, toy example of this you know, car matching uh, uh, situation. So the idea of Robin is that we are we are going to remove this third correspondence before running graduate non convexity. So in the interest of time, I will not tell you about the technical details about how Robin you know tries to remove the third correspondence, but I, rather I want to show you the performance of Robin you know in, in in this application. So here in this plot. The x axis shows the uh, percentage of outliers in the original set of matches from 50% up to 99%. And these, these, uh, these wrong matches or these outliers are random. And then this blue box plot shows the percentage of, outlier, percentage of outliers after applying Robin. So you can see that although the original uh, or the initial set of correspondences can be highly corrupted by, outli by outliers. Robin can effectively prune outliers and decrease the outlier rates to typically below you know, 10%. And this is a level that typically GNC can handle very well. And this will significantly increase the success rate of GNC. So I've, so I've talked about the high level intuition and also a little bit technical detail of both Robin and GNC. So now I'm ready to show you the practical performance of Robin and GNC on real robotic applications. So the first application that we tested is on 3D rigid, rigid registration, which is the task of merging a pair of point clouds. And the resulting algorithm is called teaser. So here I, thought, I, I want to show you this first plot, where in this plot, the x-axis shows you the percentage of outliers in the initial set of correspondences. And then here, the y-axis shows you the rotation estimation error with respect to the ground truth. And here we are benchmarking teaser against a bunch of other state-of-the-art algorithms. And notice here that teaser plus plus is the fast C plus plus version of teaser uh, using parallelization. So and so on this plot, you can see that uh, among all these state-of-the-art algorithms, teaser and teaser plus plus are the only algorithms that can tolerate 99% random outliers. And this result won't be surprising after seeing the you know the, the power of Robin from the last slide. Because we already we already know that Robin will be able to prune the majority of the wrong correspondences before running graduate non convexity. And this second plot here shows you the runtime of teaser uh, compared to other algorithms. And you can see here that our you know, teaser plus plus is also the fastest algorithm uh, among the state of the art, and it typically can run in milliseconds. So we also tested teaser on registering you know, indoor RGBD scans, which are typically much more noisier uh, than you know, LiDAR scans. And here I'm showing you an example of where the left video shows the, uh, a pair of challenging scans with correspondences produced by a neural network called 3D uh, SmoothNet. And then the right video shows you the registration result of teaser++ plus plus, uh, you know, given, this set of, given this set of correspondences. And you can see that although the original set of correspondences is, is highly corrupted by outliers, teaser plus plus can register this pair of scans to very high accuracy. And here, this table shows you the overall performance of teaser compared to RANSAC. And we can see that in some of these data, sub data sets, teaser is actually able to improve over RANSAC by 5 to 10% in terms of success rate. So I've told you that both Robin and GNC are general purpose algorithms, which means that they can be applied to more than a few perception applications. So here I want to show you the results of Robin and GNC for the problem that is known as category level object perception. And, and the, the canonical example of this category level perception is vehicle pose and shape estimation. So in this example, we only know that the, the 3D object is a car. But we don't have you know, the exact 3D model of this car in our memory. So for example, this may be a Honda, it may be a BMW, or it may be a car that the robot has never seen before. 
So in this case, because this you know, 3D model is unknown, we assume that this unknown 3D model can be parameterized by a very large library of existing uh, car shapes that, that the robot has already collected. And then, you know, this is typically called the active shape model. And then using this active shape model, we develop Robin and GNC for this type of vehicle uh, pose and shape estimation problem and tested our algorithm on the challenging uh, Apollo State self-driving data set on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. And at this, as this video shows, show, shows you, you can see that uh, our algorithm, Robin and GNC, are actually able to estimate the, the, the pose and shape of a wide range of cars in the, urban, uh, in the cluttered urban area of China. And then this table here also shows you the overall performance of our algorithm, which is PACE, but compared to other state-of-the-art uh, algorithms. And you can, from these numbers, you can see that our algorithm PACE, PACE actually also significantly outperforms previous methods that are based on deep learning. So, so far, I have you know, present you the technical details and also performance of the estimator, so which you know, significantly outperforms the state-of-the-art. But I already told you from the very beginning that this estimator is also designed to be a heuristic, which means that this heuristic, heuristic method can fail. And when it fails, it doesn't give you any notice. So for example, in the previous Apollo Scape dataset, our estimator will oftentimes give you correct estimates like this one, this one, and this one, but in difficult cases like this one. For example, you know, the car, the robot here, only has a partial observation of, of another car that is very close to itself. And in this case, the neural network actually out, uh, outputs uh, many wrong key point detections, making our estimator fail. So, you know, let me now motivate the second uh, algorithm of this toolbox by posting this question that how can a machine certify its success like the ones on the left hand side and detect and also correct its failures like the one on, on the right hand side. So in order to answer this question, I want to first present you a general mathematical formulation for solving non-convex and hard optimization problems with optimality certificates. So I want to give you a, a heads up that the, the next uh, four slides will be kind of mathematically dense, but I'll make sure to go walk through walk you through them uh, very slowly so that uh, we are all on board about this technical meet. So record that our estimator GNC is trying to solve this GLS estimation problem, which is both non-convex and also non-smooth. So the first thing that we want to do here is to get rid of this non-smoothness. And we do this by, by leveraging this identity that the minimum of two real numbers, A and B, can be equivalently written as an optimization problem over a single binary variable theta that is either plus one or minus one. So this binary variable X, you know, X, S, X, you know, is like a selection variable that selects between A and B. And then using this, uh, uh, identity, we can rewrite the original TLS estimation problem as a joint optimization now in both the original geometric model X and also a set of binary variables that indicate whether or not these measurements are in liars or outliers. So this explicitly exposes the kind of the combinatorial nature of this problem. And then for common perception problems, this joint optimization belongs to a class of optimization problem that is known as polynomial optimization or POP in short. So now this polynomial, polynomial optimization problem is actually a continuous optimization problem. But still the difficulty remains because it is still non-convex and MP hard to solve in general. So here comes the key step. So the key step here is to relax this polynomial optimization problem into a semi-definite program. So we do this by leveraging some, some machinery from applied math, applied math called Lassier's hierarchy and also basis reduction. So I will not introduce you the technical details here, but I'm, I, you know, I highly recommend you to read our paper for more technical details. But now here, I wanna tell you why we wanna relax this POP into a semi-definite program. And in, in, in particular, what is a semi-definite program and what kind of nice features this semi-definite program has that can allow us to design certified algorithms. So this SCP has two nice features. So the first nice feature is that this SCP now is actually a convex optimization problem. So for a convex optimization problem, we can actually solve this problem to global optimality in polynomial time. So record that this is the first requirement for an algorithm to be a certified algorithm. And then the other nice property of this SCP is that 
after solving this SCP, we can not only get the solution to the original POP, but also a certificate for optimality or suboptimality. So let me explain a little bit why you know, or how we can get this optimality certificate. So let me denote by POP star the optimal objective of the original POP. And let me denote by SCP star the optimal objective of this convex SCP. So because this convex SCP is a relaxation of the original POP, we have that SCP star will be a lower bound of this unknown POP star. And then we solve this SCP and we can generate a high kind of a hypothesis or a feasible point or a candidate estimate to the original POP. And I will denote as POP hat the objective value that is attained by this candidate estimation. So because the original optimization PO, you know, the, the PO, original PO, uh, point of optimization is a, mini, is a minimization problem. We, we know that any, any POP hat is actually an upper bound to this POP star. So now we have you, you sort of see that we have a sandwich or a bracket, you know, introduced by this SP star and this POP hat that actually sandwiches the this uh, this unknown POP uh, POP star, and in particular we can we can measure how tight is this bracket or this sandwich by just measuring the relative distance between this SP star and the POP hat. So if the bracket is tight, we get a suboptimality A to S that is numerically zero. Otherwise, we get the suboptimality that is non-zero. You know, if the if the POP hat is not optimal. So here comes the surprising result. So although the original POP is actually a non-convex and NP-hard problem, but in practice, after solving this SCP, we found that the bracket is actually zero for you know even in the presence of ninety percent outliers. So this means that uh, we got the certificate that we have actually obtained the globally optimal solution. To the original POP, to the, to the original point of optimization. So now, you know, I have told you that this convex SCP is a powerful tool for obtaining certified global optimal solutions to the original POP. So does this mean that you know now we are all set and we can just use this SCP to solve our original TLS estimation problem? So the the answer is actually no, and the reason is because it turns out there are no existing solvers that can solve these SCPs to sufficient accuracy arising from uh, geometric perception. And specifically, there are two reasons. So the first reason is that you know, this SCP is a relaxation of the non-convex uh, POP, but again, there's no free lunch. So here the caveat is that although this SCP is convex, it actually has a much higher dimension than the original uh, POP. And these large scale problems will make generic internal point methods run out of memory and the other reason is that these SCPs are not only large scale, but also degenerate. So degeneracy here is a property that will make you know, first order methods converge very slowly and make the well-known Bureau Monterey low rank factorization method difficult to be applied. So due to this you know, uh, you know, the, the difficulty that no existing solvers can solve these type of SCPs, we have actually designed or developed our own solver stride that can solve these type of problems. And our, the unique feature about our solver stride is actually it blends solving the POP with the SCP. In particular, given this TLS estimation framework and its semi-definite programming relaxation, stride will first use our estimator like GNC, Ransack, or even local search to generate candidate uh, estimations. And in particular, uh, you know, if this candidate estimation is already correct, then stride will use the convex SCP to certify its global, global optimality. But when the candidate estimation is incorrect, then Stride will use this convex SCP to certify suboptimality. And in cases, you know, in other cases, our you know, uh, certifier is also able to escape such uh, fa failed examples and return you better certified solutions. So in the next two slides, I wanna briefly unpack the numerical algorithm behind Stride, you know, or, or in a little bit detail about how Stride solved this semi-definite program to certify global optimality and uh, escape local minima. And I'll do this in a very pictorial way. So let's first talk about how Stride can certify global optimality. So in this slide, uh, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you, you the uh, TLS estimation framework, which is a non-convex optimization problem. So what does a non-convex optimization problem looks like? So it typically looks like this one-dimensional example where there are you know, multiple local minima 
with the left one being a, a local minimum and the right one being the global minimum that we are trying to we are trying to find. And then on the right hand side, I'm going to show you the pictorial description of the of a semi-definite program, which is a high dimensional relaxation of this one dimensional example. So what does a semi-definite program do? It tries to optimize a linear objective or minimize a linear objective over a convex feasible set that is shown as this uh, yellow 3D body. And this convex feasible set is typically referred to as a spectrohedron. And here, this blue arrow indicates the direction of lower cost. So now let's talk about how STRI certify global, global optimality using this pictorial example. So suppose now you know, our estimator GNC or RANSAC has succeeded in finding the global optimal solution of the TLS estimation. So in this case, if you stay on the left-hand side of this slide, which is non-convex optimization regime, then it is very challenging, if not impossible, to certify the global optimality of this star point. So what STRI does is to, instead of you know, relying on this non-convex optimization formulation, STRI is gonna, is gonna lift this star point uh, into a star vertex of this spectrohedron. And then what STRI tries to do is to certify that the star vertex is actually the global optimal solution for this convex optimization problem. So for a convex optimization problem, certifying global optimality is numerically tractable. And we can design an algorithm uh, to certify this. So how can we do this? So we can first you know, try to move in the direction of, of the lower cost to seek a potential reduction in the cost function. And then in this case, you see that once we move in the direction of the, of the lower cost, we will immediately move ourselves out of, outside of this spectrohedron. So therefore, we have to project ourselves back into the, onto the spectrohedron. And this step is typically known as projected gradient descent uh, in convex optimization. So here you will notice that you know, the unique thing about this star point or any optimal point is that since this point is already optimal, projected gradient descent will bring you back to this star point. And this is the numerical certificate that this star point is actually optimal for the convex SDP. And you can back, you know, deduce that this star point is actually also optimal for the original non-convex uh, TLS problem. So with this machinery, now it's also very easy to talk about how stride can escape local minimum. So now in this case, suppose, you know, our estimator has failed and converged to this square point that is a, that is a local minimum. So in this case, again, if you stay on this non-convex operation land, it's, you know, it's very challenging, if not impossible, to detect suboptimality, not to mention about escaping it. Therefore, what STRIDE does is to lift this square vertex, into, you know, lift this square point into another square vertex of this spectrohedron. So now what will happen if you, you, know, if you, per, if you perform another step of projected grid, project gradient descent? So you will see that the projected gradient descent will bring you to a new circle point that has a strictly better cost or strictly lower cost than the square vertex. So this will mean that the square vertex is not optimal for the SCP, you know, for, um, for not optimal for the SCP. So if you keep doing this projected gradient descent, you will actually converge to the optimal uh, star point. But the drawback of doing this projected gradient descent is that it actually will take a lot of iterations to converge to the uh, optimal star point. So therefore, uh, in stride, one of the one of the most significant uh, you know, contributions is actually, you know, we will not do this zigzagging projected gradient descent, but rather we will try to generate hypothesis back to this non non convex non optimization problem using a procedure that we call rounding. In the, you know, for example, in this case, we will generate two hypotheses. So the five first hypothesis will be on the left hand side, and then the second hypothesis will be on, will be this you know circle point on the right hand side of the y axis. So now that we have two hypotheses, we can you know perform standard local search by starting from these two hypotheses using you know standard nonlinear programming or Riemannian optimization. So in this case, you will notice that the first hypothesis will converge back to this uh, suboptimal point, but then the second hypothesis will converge to this optimal you know, uh, star point. So since now we found the star point that has a strictly lower cost than the original uh, GNC, uh, GNC solution, we can actually certify that the original, original solution is actually suboptimal. So now you know, we have obtained, you know, we obtained this new star point. We have to again certify that the star point is indeed optimal for the non-convex problem. 
and you know it is lucky because we've already done that on you know on the last on from the last slide that is we can we can just redo this lifting process and redo projected gradient descent that will bring us back to the uh, star point and then this again certify uh, serves as the numerical certificate that then that can certify the global optimality of the new star point so hopefully this is a clear and high level uh, you know uh, idea, you know, um, concept of the numerical scheme uh, behind stride. So with this, I want to show you the kind of the improved scalability and accuracy uh, of, of our algorithm stride compared to other uh, solvers. So in this table, I'm, I'm showing the, you the numerical results on, on, on a problem that is known as the outlier robust WABA problem. So it's very similar to the 3D registration problem that we've been using, uh, you know, in this talk. It's the only difference is that we assume the translation is already estimated, and we are only estimating the three degrees of freedom uh, rotation matrix. So in this table, uh, the you know the number d here uh, indicates the dimension of the original polynomial optimization problem, and here the n and m are the dimensions of the semi-definite program. So you can see that although this SCP is a convex problem, it actually has much higher dimension than the original POP. And here, you know, we're using several metrics to, to measure optimality. So here are the metrics, you know, eta, p, d, and g are the standard KKD residuals for measuring SCP optimality. So when these residuals are zero, it certifies that we have obtained the optimal solution of the convex SCP. And then there's a fourth metric that is eta s. This is a metric that, uh, that I've already told you uh, in the previous slide, which is the suboptimality of the original POP. So if this eta s is also numerically zero, then we can we, we get the numerical certificate that we've obtained the optimal solution of the original uh, POP. So now let's look at the performance of different solvers. So if you look at interior point methods, you will see that these algorithms are generic purpose. So they are very good at solving small scale problems to high accuracy and you know, give you the numerical optimality certificate. But for medium scale and large scale problems, these algorithms typically quickly run out of memory and cannot be cannot be used for our for our problems. So if you look at you know you know first order methods or methods based on augmented Lagrangian, you will see that these methods are actually memory efficient and also scalable. But the downside is that because they are doing that kind of zigzagging projected gradient descent, they actually converge very slowly and cannot you know cannot solve these SCPs to sufficient accuracy within enough time. Therefore, they cannot certify global optimality of the solution that we've obtained. So if you look at the last column, which is our solver stride, you'll see that our solver is both accurate and also scalable. In fact, it's the only solver that can solve you know, problems of realistic sizes in geometric perception. And you know, from these numbers here, you can see that our, our solver can actually solve to solve SCP problems with up to 3 million of uh, linear, linear quality constraints. You know, this is also a big uh, advance in, 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 in applied mathematics. So with this, you know, uh, qu quantitative examples, and now I want to show you some qualitative examples uh, in applying stride to, uh, to real robotic applications. And the first application, again, is 3D uh, registration of a pair of LiDAR scans. So in this slide, you can see that given uh, correspondences produced by FVFH and Robin, you can see that you know stride is able to give you both an accurate estimate as well as a certificate of global optimality and then uh, this slide here shows you the results of stride on, uh, on the uh, much much more complicated problem you know, that is vehicle pose and shape joint estimation and you will see that in this case stride is also able to ask, give you correct estimates of the pose as well as optimality certificates when these uh, estimates are actually correct so notice that if you look at the runtime, uh, stride is still far from uh, being real time. But again, you know, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first time that we can certify global optimality in problems of such higher dimension. So in this slide, I, I want to show you that stride can not only certify our estimator, which is GNC, it can also certify RANSAC, you know, that is commonly used in computer vision and robotics. So in this satellite pose estimation example, our goal is to estimate the pose of this uh, satellite. Given course, given key point detections uh, that are corrupted by random outliers, and you can see that when RANSAC succeeds in estimating uh, the the pose of the satellite, Shri can actually give you a precise numerical uh, optimality certificate. 
So in the last slide, I want to show you the capability of Stride in escaping suboptimal solutions in, in challenging cases. So in, these, uh, in this slide, the first row gives you three challenging cases where our estimator GNC failed. And you can see that in these three examples, the object is, is either too far away or too close by, and the neural network produces too many uh, wrong key point detections, making the estimator a fail. But in this case, you see that our, uh, our, our, our solver stride is able to escape such uh, suboptimal sub solutions and return you better certified optimal solutions. So that concludes you know, the, uh, the, uh, my presentation in certified perception. So now I wanna very briefly tell you some open perspectives and opportunities that can bring certified perception one step further. So the first opportunity is what I call from solver to data uh, to faster solver. So in my presentation, I've already told you that solving large scale SCPs is actually crucial for obtaining apprentice certificates in geometric perception. And our contribution is to, is to design a solver stride that can solve these problems that are, you know, can, that cannot be solved by existing solvers. So here the question comes, comes in is that, you know, stride is still far from being real time. So how can we potentially make stride run faster and, you know, for our robotic applications? So here, I think there is an opportunity of leveraging the data. So stride is a solver, but you can see, also see stride as a generator of data. So basically it generates these pairs of data where you have the problem data to these SDB solutions. So then if we use Stride to offline and solve many problems arising in certain perception application, then we can actually learn a mapping that can directly bypass Stride and predict the solutions from the problem data. And then at runtime, when we want to solve problems, we can use these predicted solutions as a warm-up initialization to our convex optimization solver. And we, you know, this convex optimization solver will bring us to global optimality. So the second uh, opportunity here is from global optimization to, to safe perception. So in a, you know in this uh, talk I, I you know I keep using this example where you know I'm giving uh, I'm giving you key point detections of this car and certified perception will be able to give you the optimal post estimate of this of this uh, car. But here the question that one should ask is that is the optimal solution always the safe or the desired solution that you're trying to look for? So of course the answer is obviously no, because for example, if we assume you know, these key points do not lie on, these, uh, lie on the car, but rather lie on the pedestrians, then even if you solve this you know, optimization problem to global optimality, the result you get will have nothing to do with the pose of the car. So therefore we need certain conditions, certain checkable conditions uh, that, can, that can ensure that optimality uh, is equal to safety. And we call these, uh, you know, uh, conditions estimation contract, and these by far have you know uh, has been uh, has been uh, discovered very little uh, in 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 perception applications. And in the future, we need to you know devise such estimation contract for many perception problems. And the second question here is you know now that we have a certifiable backend which performs geometric estimation in the in a, in a certified global uh, op optimal way, can we use this backend to feed back the front end and help us design you know, better feature learning methods. So in, in, our, in the recent work that we published at CVPR last year, we've shown that actually robust estimation can enable self-supervised geometric perception that has, similar pro that has similar or even better performance than supervised methods. And moving forward, I think, on, you know, there's this opportunity of designing a new stream of algorithms and theory that can better couple the front end and the back end and help us design methods uh, that can, you know, for joint feature estimation and for joint feature learning and model estimation for safe robotic applications. And the last opportunity is what I call from perception to active perception. So in robotic, it, it, robotic, it is typically believed that robots perceive in order to act. But sometimes you, we really need to act in order to perceive. So for example, here, I wanna, I wanna give you a very simple example of target tracking. So for example, if the, if the blue car is tracking the yellow car, in this first picture, tracking can be safe and sound because this yellow car is right in front of the, the blue car. But however, if we suppose the, you know, the, the, the red car here can be a little bit, little bit adversarial and moves in front of the blue car and it blocks the yellow car from the blue car's vision. In this case, if the blue car does not move or does not act, 
Then it will soon lose track of this yellow car and the, the target tracking uh, mission will, will fail. But however, if the blue car knows how to you know, react to, the, to this observer example and move to the right lane, then it will it actually regain perception of this yellow car and uh, you know, the, the target tracking uh, mission will, will again succeed. So notice here there, there is this natural perception action loop which is very easy for me as a human to describe and for the audience to understand. But in robotics, I'm, I'm afraid that we know very little about how to model you know, the, the, the loop, you know, the, the feedback between uh, perception and action. And I think now you know, the time is mature that we need to design a set of theory and algorithms to close the perception action loop. And in particular, how can we you know, leverage uh, you know, uh, insights that, that, I've talked in, that I've presented in this talk about safe perception Two works that you know that are focused on safe control and safe planning and also safe learning. So with that, I want to you know conclude my talk by giving you this a brief summary of what I've what I've presented, and also you know, you know want to thank my awesome uh, collaborators from MIT, from University of Michigan, and in particular from uh, National University of Singapore because uh, these mathematicians they they help us a lot in in designing uh, the solver stride that is crucial in certified perception. I want to I want to also thank. Uh, uh, funding resources behind all these projects uh, that I've talked about, and feel free to use the uh, open source implementations uh, that I've that I've that I've presented uh, in today's talk. And uh, with that, I want to thank the organizers again for having me today, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions from the audience. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, you guys can either ask questions or you can write them in the chat, and I can read them out loud. Uh, yeah, yeah. May, may I ask a question? Like. Uh, so your method is kind of classic uh, statistical machine learning method, right? Like using optimization things. It's kind of different from the deep learning uh, based method, right? Yes. So yes. So it's a very good question. So uh, so I think these days, uh, uh, you know, I mentioned that the, the typical perception, line, perception pipeline is divided into this front end uh, that is using deep learning to uh, produce key points. And then the back end is using optimization or classical model-based methods to estimate the geometric models. But nowadays, you know, the fully end-to-end -end method is becoming uh, is becoming very popular. So basically, you can directly regress the uh, the poses uh, using CNNs or, or other machine learning methods. I think uh, post CNN is a, is a great example by uh, by Adira Fox from 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 UW. But I think you know there are multi, there are pros and cons uh, of of each side. But here I want to mention that. Uh, this classical model-based method can also be uh, integrated into deep learning. So for example, I mentioned that uh, in the last slide that uh, if we, uh, you know, if we have this uh, backend that is certifiable, then we can sort of differentiate through this optimization backend. And in this case, we can actually, you know, jointly perform feature estimation and model, uh, jointly perform feature learning and model estimation uh, by doing, by designing other types of optimization algorithms that uh, that is a mixture of for example stochastic gradient descent and uh, semi-definite program but that's uh, that that's uh, for now this is uh, still an ongoing research and i think it's quite open yeah yeah okay so you mean uh, uh, integrate the model based uh, matter into the deep learning based matter is is kind of uh, still separate them into two parts or or, or just uh, integrate them to one part like and uh, yeah, uh, I think there are there are two there are two ways. Uh, so the one way is you know you you just use your uh, insights from uh, classical model based geometry uh, to help you design better neural networks. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a, there is a major there is a huge amount of line a uh, huge amount of work in, in that you can you can see many of them in CBPR ICCB. For example, I think there there are, there is work using multi view geometry. And uh, for example, epipolar constraints uh, in helping design better uh, machine learning methods. So that's uh, the first uh, type of way you can integrate uh, classical methods uh, into deep learning. The second type, the second way, uh, which I prefer, is to keep the model based, uh, keep the model based optimization. Because the advantage of this of these model based methods is that I think uh, many of us uh, will accept this. Because is what I want to say here is that uh, if the key points are good enough. Then model-based methods typically give you give you results that are much more accurate. You, if you have enough correspondences and many of them are correct, then you will, you will get uh, estimation you know estimation results that are very accurate compared to the ground truth. And you can also derive performance guarantees from these uh, 
from these estimation, uh, from these classical model-based methods. So that is the advantage of using model-based uh, methods in deep learning. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we're a little bit over time here, but I appreciate you all for joining. You guys have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again.